This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in well, good morning and blessings, church family. Hey, just want to bring you a few quick announcements. We're uh, <clears throat> we're fellowshipping, watching football tonight. Say hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> hey, uh, coming up this week, uh, we got board retreat next Saturday and the Ormus Chili Fire. All our midweek ministries should be the same. Women's Bible study tonight, uh, praise team practice Wednesday night. Uh, outside of that, uh, any and all announcements should be on the back of the bulletin. Uh, reminder, next Sunday we are celebrating communion together, so be prepared for that. Uh, with that, the elders will be remaining up front after service today. And as a reminder, please get the annual surveys uh, turned in for the board, board retreat. Blessings, church family. A couple other uh, quick announcements before we do the call of worship. Uh, Ormus Chili Fire, uh, again, is coming up this Saturday. If you are um, providing cookies or taking food, they are asking for food to be on site by 445. So if you're making something uh, but are not able to attend, uh, arrange with Corey drop-off pickup time and we can take it with us. Um, you made me forget my other announcement. Um, I had another one. What was the other one? Uh, surveys, if you didn't fill it out yet or if you weren't here last week, get a hard copy. They are on the back divider. Um, it's 15 question doesn't take very long to fill out, but it does help us out a lot at our board retreat coming up this week. So uh, during meet and greet time, if you would pick one of those up, if you didn't fill it out yet, uh, just fill it out throughout service and get it to me at the end of service. I would appreciate it. There was another announcement I had, and I can't remember it right now. No. Oh, um, for those of you who uh, said you were interested in helping with um, making coffee and doing greeting, opening up on Sunday mornings, I'd like to ask that uh, all of those that said, yes, I'm interested in helping out with that, next Sunday meet me here at the church at 8 a.m. so I can show you all together at one time what needs to be done and then you guys can work out a, a rotating schedule beyond that point um, and we can go from there. So if you are available next Sunday at 8 a.m. Uh, wanting to help out with that aspect of a ministry, um, I'd appreciate your time if you can, can do that. Uh, is there any others I'm missing? No? Good. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Go Buckeyes. Uh, I figured somebody needed to say that. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, let's see here. Uh, call to worship. If you would, uh, go ahead and join me and stand if you're able. Hey, I didn't know who to root for, honestly, but I figured I might as well be on the winning side when I say that. So, All right. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphant procession. And through us spreads the fragrance of the right to the For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. For we are not so many peddlers of God's word. But as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, to speak in Christ. Our Father, I thank you for today. Lord, I thank you for the beautiful day that you've allowed. I thank you for allowing our church family to come together again today. And Lord, I do just lift up at this time together that it would be a good time of, uh, of uh, learning as you would have us to learn. Lord, I pray for the words that you would give our pastor. I pray, Lord, for those that are traveling today. Lord, that you would be with them and uh, just in their endeavors. And, Lord, we just pray for everybody to be able to come back together again safely. And Lord, we just ask your blessing upon this time, upon this church family. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.
And if you're following in the hymnal, number 550, and continue standing if you are able. Well, good morning, everyone, <clears throat> and again, welcome to Burr Oak. For those of you who uh, do not know me, whether you're here visiting for the first time or viewing this online, I am Pastor Ben, and it is my humble joy to be able to bring you God's Word today. The last two weeks, we have been looking at how to overcome discouragement. We ended last week 
by highlighting six things the Christian needs to do to overcome discouragement. As a reminder, those six points is one, we do not entertain temptation of any kind. Two, you lean into your relationship with Yahweh so that you may grow in discernment. Three, you seek out what in your heart that you are wanting, desiring, or worshiping other than Yahweh. And four, you remember what Yahweh has done previously. You look back for assurance that he will continue to work now. Five, you press on in the work that Yahweh has called you to do. And number six, you continue to establish the community of believers. And we had discussed briefly last week with number five and number six, that if you're sitting at a moment where you're, you're wondering, Lord, what is it you're wanting me to be doing in this specific moment? Um, that if you don't know, just do number six. Find someone to talk to. Find someone to share your faith with. Find someone to serve. And you continue to establish that community of believers. Now, one of the themes that connects all six of these points is God's word. God's word commands us to not entertain temptation. We grow in our relationship with God and in discernment through God's word by the power of his spirit. We realign our hearts with God's word. God's word shows us what Yahweh has done previously. God's word shows us what we are to continue to be doing. And finally, God's word governs this community that we are to establish. Now, this morning, we're going to spend our time looking at our response to God's word. When we read through it, when we study it, how do we respond to that which we have come to read? Before we get to our passage, though, let us first have our hearts and minds brought to attention with our focus verse. So go ahead and recite this with me. Creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. Okay, guys only. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Psalm 51, verses 10 through 12. Now, ladies. Please pray with me. Father, you have again allowed us to come together today. This is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, as we prepare to receive your word, we ask that you open our hearts and our minds to understand it. We ask, Lord, that whatever may have happened over the course of this past week or what may have happened even this morning before church or on our way to church, that Satan is trying to use as a distraction that you just hold that at bay and let us just come before you. Father, what we ultimately want is just for you to present yourself to us this morning. For those, Lord, who are in the midst of a time of, of mourning or of sorrow, we just ask that you bring them comfort and peace. For those who are currently experiencing weary, worry or or fear, we ask that you bring them courage. For those that are harboring sin, Lord, struggling with how to overcome it, we ask that you bring a conviction that they might be able to walk in the freedom of the light of Christ. Father, we ask your blessing on our message for today. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, the title of our message for today is our reaction to God's word, conviction, and celebration, and we're going to be looking to Nehemiah chapter 8. If you brought your own Bible and want to follow along uh, in that or on your personal device, please turn to Nehemiah 8 now. If you're going to use the uh, Blue Pew Bible, it's on page 444, uh, or as always, you can follow along on the screen. Nehemiah 
chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Let us hear the word of the Lord. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gates. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they had made for the purpose. And besides him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, Padiah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashem, Heshbanana, Zechariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people as he opened it, and all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord and the great God, and the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Echab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kilaitai, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read it from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all of the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. On the second day, the heads of the fathers' houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month and that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns and in Jerusalem, go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booths for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square of the gate of Ephraim. And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in the booths, for from the days of Jeshua the son of Nun to the day of the people of Israel, to that day the people of Israel had not done so, and there was a very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, this morning, as we consider our passion, or passion, as we consider our passage and our reaction to Yahweh's word, uh, we're going to do so by looking to the three points from our logo. Um, If you have a bulletin with you, uh, you'll find it both on the inside of the front cover and on the very back cover as a watermark. You'll read there, Burr Oak, Real Life, Real Family, Real Faith. Uh, and as a reminder, a little over a year ago, um, we put these out as a church family. And we said that, yes, this is who we are, this is what we stand for. Um, and if I remember right, in the congregational meeting we held after service, 
uh, the, the Sunday we talked about this, it was mentioned that this wasn't anything new. This is who Baroque always has been. And that greatly excited me because my desire was not to have us become something that we weren't already, but to discover what we already naturally were. Now in that time, we've had several new people join our congregation, and I thought it would be good for us to revisit these. And it aligns with our passage from today. Uh, so this morning, we're going to take some time, and we're going to look at Nehemiah 8. And we're going to look at what really real life, real family, and real faith means here at Borough. And we're going to just get reminded of that as we continue to move forward in this uh, work of revitalization. Now, last week, we looked at how Nehemiah has now completed the walls and sees that the city is rather empty of people and no houses had been rebuilt. We read that in verse 4 of chapter 7. We discussed how part of this work that Nehemiah was to do was to go and establish the community. After looking at the genealogies last week and discussing what the genealogies meant at this point in Nehemiah, it's important for us to understand where Nehemiah goes next in the, in the book. It's important for us to realize that we cannot separate chapter 8 from the previous one. Rather, it's important for us to understand why we have Nehemiah 8 after Nehemiah 7. Nehemiah, seeing that the city is not full of people and that the houses are not rebuilt, uh, it's important for us to see that he doesn't run to putting a plan together to do that. We've seen throughout Nehemiah where he's, he's a great planner, he's a great leader, he can sit down and assess a situation and put a plan together to accomplish a goal. We've, we've seen that principle. And so here he states in chapter 7, the walls are built, but the city is wide and large, the people are few, and no houses are rebuilt. In chapter 8, we do not see the plan to accomplish the problem, the solution to the problem from chapter 7. See, rather, into, rather instead of running to the plan to establish these things, we see him turn to the only thing that can truly give life, and that's Yahweh's word. He says, all the people were gathered as one into the square, and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. And he read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and all those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. What we see here in Nehemiah 8 is a principle that we see all throughout Scripture. In fact, we see it in the very first few lines of our Bible. Genesis 1, chapter, Genesis 1 verses 2 through 3. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Within the first few lines of our Bible, we read of a scenario that depicts no form, no life. The direct translation from the Hebrew would be something along the lines of an empty wasteland or an empty desert. The change to this empty wasteland was the spoken word of God. That's what began the change in Genesis 1. Picking up on this in his gospel, John attributes this word of God to Jesus. We read in John 1, verses 1 through 4, he says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was, any, was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Jumping to verse 14, he says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This word that became flesh was the light of men. And in describing himself being this light, being this life, Jesus states in John 10.10, 10, he says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
then in 14 6 he says jesus said to him i am the way and the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me jesus came so that man may have life abundantly and find their way back to the father through him he came so that where chaos where disorder, where darkness reign, that there may be light, and that light give life to a chaotic situation. This is a principle that we see about God and his word all throughout scripture. See, we need to understand that that is the work of the word of God, whether it be the living word, as in Jesus, or his written word that we have in our Bible. It is to testify about what God has done so that man may find true life. But this doesn't happen by ignoring life. And it doesn't happen by treating the Bible as just a list of commands that we need to follow. See, it comes from seeing how the Bible is sufficient to address the issues we face in life. This is what we see in Nehemiah. We have seen to this point several internal issues with the Jewish people. They were buying each other as slaves. They were charging interest to one another, going against their laws. They were intermarrying with the enemy. They were boasting about the deeds of the enemy. Internally, the Jews were wreaked full of sin. And what we see today is that in light of these issues, to begin to establish this community, they turn towards God's word and growing in their understanding of it. This too is what we have determined we are about here at Baroque. This brings us to our first reel, that being real life. Pulling right from our website, our statement goes uh, as this along with real life. It says, at Baroque, we do not shy away from the fact that there are times when life is hard. We believe that in these moments, our family and our faith is what can carry us, uh, carry us through and yes, help us to even find joy in it. That is why we seek to cultivate a real family atmosphere here at Borough, where we can grow together in our faith in Jesus Christ. When life's trials come our way with the support of our family and the rest, <clears throat> we rest in the fact that with confidence we can approach the throne of God to find grace and mercy in our time of need. See, along with this, we recognize that God's word addresses real life. Now, see, we do not hold that our Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales compiled together. Uh, we do not hold to that this is simply a book for uh, moral character teaching. Uh, rather, we hold that these stories are about real people in real time and places going through real experiences and how the almighty creator Yahweh worked through those experiences. That's what we hold the Bible to be. Real history with real principles and training, with real intervention by a very real God. By standing on that, that means that we also hold that Yahweh's word is sufficient to help us in our time of need. That part of grace and mercy we find is guidance in how to navigate the situations we find ourselves in. Yet one of the things that we wrestle with is understanding God's word. You may read through a part of it and go, I, I have no idea what this means. I don't know how this applies to my life. And we wrestle with that. Fortunately, Yahweh has not left us alone to figure it out. And looking back to our passage for today, we see this principle. Nehemiah records that besides just Ezra reading it, that there was this whole list of men who helped the people understand the law while the people remained in their places. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Now, last week, I mentioned how... Um, over this past year, one of the goals that I had set was putting together uh, a preaching team, beginning that, training others to be able to preach. And I stated how I stated how this is how I can edify the saints by teaching others how to teach God's word. I also mentioned that it would be poor shepherding on my part if I did not equip others to teach if something was ever to happen to me. 
The other aspect to this is because of what we see here in Nehemiah. While Ezra did the teaching, there were other men who helped the people in attendance to understand what was being taught. Uh, see, it is most beneficial to a congregation when there are multiple men who can teach. As you guys who are listening will connect and relate to different stories and different aspects of teaching from multiple people instead of one person. This helps the congregation grow most spiritually. You see, there are more and more studies coming out now showing that a senior pastor or the primary teaching pastor should only preach somewhere between 60 and 75% of the time throughout the course of the year. See, when it, when it comes to experiencing real life, what we all live in every day, those struggles that we wrestle with as, as part of the human experience, it's impossible for one person to be able to relate to every aspect. But as the collective, we can. As the collective, we can deal with more. We can help guide people through more. We can help point to God's word more. We can help glorify God more. When it comes to real life, that means as we struggle with different aspects to the human experience, none of us need to be fully equipped to handle it all, but rather as the collective, we should be. And this is where biblical counseling comes in. I was recently part of a, a meeting with biblical counselors from all around the country looking at how to create support groups for counselors within their local areas. In the meet and greet time, I mentioned that I am looking at how biblical counseling and church revitalization go hand in hand. When it came back around to our host, he mentioned that he's already walked a very similar path, and he has found that with the younger generation, uh, so millennials, Gen Zs, uh, <coughs> biblical counseling is directly tied to church revitalization. And the reason being is that because the millennials and the Gen Zs, uh, they're not sold on flashy lights and big productions. Uh, rather, what we really desire is transparency. We want practicality. We want to know what God's word says about my life and how does it impact it. We want real life. We don't want flashy catchphrases, but with honest and sincerity, we want to work through the hardest parts of life to see that God's word really is true. That's what the younger generations are ultimately looking for. Real connection, real impact by God's word. Yet, how is this done? How do we get to achieving that? That brings us to our second point, real family. Skipping around in our passage a little bit for today, we're going to see where real family begins. And we see this in... Uh, verses 13 through 15 from today. It says, on the second day, on the second day, the heads of the father's houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together with Ezra, the scribe, in order to study the words of the law. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim it publish it in all the towns in Jerusalem, go out to the hills and bring branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booze as it is written. After having God's word read to them, we come to this next thing that takes place. And this, as I said, it's the second day. The first day they read the word, the second day this takes place. We see that the men of the town, the men of the community came together to study the word and they see in it that they are to honor Yahweh through a specific means of worship. In this content specifically, it was through the keeping of the Festival of Tents or the Festival of Booths. Um, here is where we need to stop and be reminded of what was stated in chapter 7. Chapter 7 said that the city was wide and large, the people were few, and the houses had not been rebuilt. Men, with that in mind, the men specifically, I, I want to I ask you something. If your family was without a house to live in, and you had all the material to build it, or your house had 
been heavily damaged and you had all the material to repair it, would you get right after that building or those repairs or, or would you put it off for eight days to go live in a tent? To go fellowship with other people, to eat big festival meals, and to study the Bible? Which would you be inclined to lean toward? And as a reminder, this is not one of your newer tents that we're staying in, but we're going to go out and we're going to go cut branches and big leafy trees and build these makeshift shelters. And that's what we're going to have our family stay in for the next eight days while our houses are in shambles. Which would you lean towards? See, our natural inclination is to lean towards rebuilding or repairing our house. Let me bring this to a more modern type of example. Men, if you have a home repair project that needs to be done and Sunday is the only day of the week you see yourself having available to complete this project, are you going to be content with just sending your wife and kids to church while you stay home, or are you going to lead them in going to corporately worship Yahweh together? Are you going to put off that natural inclination of self-provision and go and intentionally worship your God? You see, men, at some point, we need to own what we have allowed ourselves to become in regards to the life of the church. Jesus states this pretty clearly in Matthew chapter 23. The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works that they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long, and they love the place of honor of the feasts and the best seats in the synagogues and the greetings in the marketplace and being called rabbi by others. Picking up on this, Paul Washer in his message on the sufficiency of scripture at the G3 2017 conference in which they celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation had this to say to the crowd while discussing whether we still stand for what the reformers did. He asked, he asked, are our homes reformed? Are we discipling? Are we washing our wives in the word? Are we discipling our children? maybe catechizing them, at least family devotions, consistently and purposefully. Are we doing that? The Reformers did. Matthew Henry did. Paul Henry did. Understand that John Calvin and Luther were not hated because of their doctrine of soteriology. They were hated because of their doctrine of marriage and family. He goes on to present a very practical situation. Paul sure then state, Walsher then states this. He says, let me give you an example. If I walked into a church and I said this, how many, if all your men were there, and I said, how many of you men are purposely, consistently, intentionally discipling, discipling your wives and your children, would it not be true in a typical evangelical church or even the Reformed church that we would have men look around at each other and go, it wouldn't even really brush up against them. He ends by saying this. But then if I said this, as well since we're not doing that, then starting now, I'm canceling all the women's groups, all the children's groups, children's church, youth groups, college group. I'm canceling it all. What would they do? They would rise up and start screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And you know what? I would tell them, you hypocrites. You will know the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions. He closes by saying, I'm all in favor of it, don't get me wrong. But let me tell you something. In most churches, what it is is that the church is doing something in order to give all the men in the church the excuse for not obeying God. Men are to lead. That is what scripture shows. 
And oftentimes, and I am guilty of this as well, oftentimes we are content with the children's ministries to allow our wives to be busy raising our children while we do not. Washer hits a very key point here. And it's a very key point to the struggle with the American church within society. Many men are content having the title of pastor or elder or deacon, but rarely are they getting after the work that they are called to do. And I'll be open and honest, I am someone who struggles with the idea of Sabbath. I am someone who struggles with the idea that when you are actively in ministry, that family comes first. And I may be wrong. I may, very be, I may be very short in my understanding, but when I read through the Bible, Jesus calls for a very large sacrifice and honoring and glorifying him above all else. And there are often times that family plans, Sabbath day is something we idolize and worship more than God. And we have to wrestle through that. See, the men of Nehemiah's day came to see the importance to lead their communities in worship, even in the face of practical needs that needed to be met. Does this mean that God does not care about our practical needs? No. No. We see all throughout that God cares about our practical needs, but what he cares about more than our practical need is where our heart lies. What is it worshiping? Is it looking to him first and foremost for everything? So what does this mean for us, given our second real, real family? Well, as a reminder, right from our website again, at Borough, we believe that it is God who has allowed us to be a family, and that through his love that he has lavished on us, we can identify as his children, and therefore we love each other in real and practical ways. As his children, he has given us his word as instruction for how we are to live in his family. We believe that there is always an open spot at the table and that our Heavenly Father has instructed us to go and grow his family. We believe that God's family is located all around the world, and as such, we pray for these fellow brothers and sisters, regardless of their distance from our physical location. We rejoice for them in the times of celebration, and we will weep alongside them in times of persecution. Men, are you content with your wife and kids taking part in the ministry opportunities here at Bur Bur Oak? Or are you getting involved as well? Are you finding practical ways to love those around you and to demonstrate for your wife and kids what real ministry looks like? Are you leading them in prayer? Are you leading them in growing in your understanding and ability to teach God's word even at home? How, men, are you specifically contributing to real family? Now, I will not deny that at times this can feel like a pretty tall order to step up to. And many men feel unequipped to lead in these types of fashions, or when they have, they've been met with pushback from their wife and kids, and so they retreat to where they feel most comfortable. But that doesn't mean that we should give up the position that God has called us to. I want you to see I want you to see what happened when the men of Nehemiah's day stepped up and did what they should. Verse 17 And all the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity and made booth and lived in the booth for from the days of Jeshua the son of Nun for those who um, might be a little confused, this is also Joshua. Joshua the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was a very great rejoicing. I want you to think for just a minute, the time lapse from Joshua to Nehemiah. Hundreds and hundreds of years. They had not kept this particular festival. They had not worshipped God in this fashion until the returned exile. And when the, med, when the men led their families in doing that, there was a great rejoicing community-wide. 
See, when we operate in accordance to Yahweh's will and order, the end result should be a great rejoicing. This is where our last point comes in for today. Real faith. As we get to this next point, we're going to see here from Nehemiah the first two markers from the path of revitalization. People's hearts soften in the desire to grow in godly wisdom and the repentance of sin. Looking to verses uh, 8 and 9 from today. They read in the book from the law of God clearly and they gave assent so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. The people heard and understood and were convicted. Their hearts were broken over their waywardness and Yahweh's faithfulness. We have talked about seeing, tasting, and experiencing the beauty of God as presented in the gospel. This is where that comes about. See, when we finally recognize how prone to waywardness we are in thought and in deed, yet Yahweh is still faithful. We are prone to wander. But God is still faithful. Matt Boswell and Matt Papa have a song they wrote about five years ago titled, His Mercy is More. The first couple of verses and chorus read this. What love could remember no wrongs we have done, omniscient all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins they are many, his mercy is more. What patience would wait as we constantly roam, what father so tender is calling us home, he welcomes the weakest, the vilest, the poor. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. His mercy is more. Stronger than darkness, new every morn. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. His mercy is a treasure in value that knows no end. Nehemiah shows us that. When the people mourned over this realization, they were instructed to stop mourning, to stop grieving, and to celebrate because the Lord in his day is holy. This is where real faith comes in. The type of faith that tells us that regardless of the situations that we find ourselves in, Yahweh will not go back on what he has promised. In essence, this is what the Jews in Nehemiah's day were being reminded of. When it comes to real faith, here at Burr Oak, this is what we believe. At Burr Oak, it is our faith in Jesus Christ that carries us on. While our faith is deeply personal part of each of us, we believe that our faith calls us to action by sharing our faith through the many real ways we live in community. We seek to demonstrate our faith in both truth and action by how we love God and how we love those around us. We believe by keeping our focus on Jesus, our minds can become transformed which in turn transforms our homes, our communities, and so on. If we do not have faith, what are we left with? Without faith, we are left being fearful. Fearful of the future, fearful of the here and now, fearful of how we will make it through, fearful of if we are loved, fearful that we are not forgiven, fearful that we are not enough, fearful of our own thoughts, and so on. Regarding this, D.A. Carson states, what is clear in that both the Gospels of Mark and Matthew that set forth faith over against fear. Faith chases out fear, or fear chases out faith. Do you have faith that through the accomplished work of Jesus on the cross that you no longer need to live as you once did? Do you have faith that Yahweh has really spelt out within his word how you can find peace and blessing within this life of trouble and chaos? Do you have faith that the weeping and the mourning you have from the conviction of your sin will only last the night for joy will come in the morning? That is what we see from this part of Nehemiah. When we are confronted with our waywardness, our proneness to wandering, Yahweh's mercy is forevermore. 
Next week, we are celebrating communion. As we have been doing, the elders will remain up front after service today for anyone wanting prayer. Uh, we will ask you two questions. One, what would you like prayer for? And two, do you have anything you need to repent of? And see, the scriptures tell us that before we partake in communion, we should repent of anything that we have. We should seek reconciliations with brothers and sisters in Christ if there's anything that we hold against them or they hold against us. See, I want you to understand that our reason for doing this, for allowing prayer and for asking if there's anything to repent of, it is not so that the elders of this church can know every little detail about your life and make sure that you're walking a hard line. That's not it. Because if, if, if we did that, we would be so guilty of being hypocrites, it wouldn't even be funny. We are men in need of God's grace as well. We need to strive for holiness in our own lives as well. See, in, in doing this, this isn't to know every little detail of your life, nor is this mandated confession. Rather, this is an opportunity for you to have rejoicing in the Lord because of your faith in him and his faithfulness to you. See, if the Spirit is laying a conviction on your heart of something to deal with, don't ignore that. Don't ignore it. The Spirit wants to turn your mourning into rejoicing. And that means that oftentimes as we work through this life and we seek to find what has captured our hearts more than Yahweh, we have to struggle with conviction before we have celebration. Do not treat communion meal as just another religious act that we do every couple of months. Take the scripture serious and strive for holiness and reconciliation within your own life. Closing today, here at Burr Oak, we are about real life, real family, and real faith. But for these to be true, it means that we really need to stand on Yahweh's word. Do we take his instructions to us seriously? Paul tells us near the end of 1 Corinthians 13 that all that remains now is faith, hope, and love, the greatest being love. Do we have the faith that how Yahweh has called us to live is really for our benefit? Do we find our hope in the accomplished work of Jesus and his promise to one day return for us? And do we rest in Yahweh's love for us and seek to grow in our love for him and those around us? See, as we grow in these areas, as we grow in realness of faith, the angst that we feel, that, that wrestle, that struggle we have, feel as we go through the, he, the human experience, it can subside. And we can experience what Nehemiah instructed the Jews in verses 9 through 10. This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Go your way. Eat the fat, drink the sweet wine, send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to the Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. There is a purpose for conviction. It is the Spirit wanting us to be in right alignment for him, with him. It is the Spirit wanting to lead us into appropriate celebration. So do not mourn or be grieved today. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. It is what helps carries us through. It is what can take us in the midst of whatever situation we find ourselves in and see that God will work all of it for good. That he will help us to be more than simply conquerors. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for this day. Lord, we ask that you continue to help us just to grow in you. 
to trust in you, to rely on you. You are so good to us. And it has shown that no matter how far we roam, if we come before you, if we repent, you are faithful evermore. Lord, we praise your name this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Father, again, this is the day that you have made. Let us rejoice and be glad. You are the one who has caused all things to be and in whom all things find their being. Let us forever praise your name. Lord, we come before you this morning in repentance, seeking forgiveness of our sins against you and each other. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins committed both in thought and deed. Forgive us, Lord, when we sin by failing to act. Forgive us, Lord, when we give way to temptation and fulfill the desires of our flesh. Forgive us, Lord, when we do not keep in step with your spirit. Forgive us, Lord, for failing to live in the way you have commanded us to. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we do want to intercede for those around us. Each day we learn more that are facing trials and tribulations. Lord, we come before you on their behalf. Father, there are many who seek the different vices that this world has to offer to find numbness for the pain that they are feeling. Lord, we ask that uh, we ask that you would put people along their path that could point to you, that they may be able to come to know you, to find true freedom. Father, there are some who are so overwhelmed with worry and fear and anxiety that it paralyzes them. Father, we pray that uh, they would come to find their peace and security in you alone. Lord, there are many who are dealing with health issues, bodies weakening, bodies that struggle to accomplish things that their minds tell them that they can do. Lord, we ask for healing for these individuals, that they may be able to sing your praises. Father, there are those who do not know where their next meal is going to come from, who do not know how they may make it through the upcoming winter, who are in need of a place to live. Father, we would pray that you would provide for them. Lord, we continue to lift up our missionaries wherever they may be located. Father, we seek your blessing upon their ministries. Lord, we lift up to you local ministries, Noble House, Inspiration Ministries, LifeWise Academy, Miracle Tree, Gateway Woods, and there's many more. Each of these organizations seek to transform our local community. We ask that you bless them in their endeavors and show us how we can partner with them. Father, we also pray for, for the other churches of our area. We know there are many struggling. Lord, we pray that they'd stand on your word. We pray that you would bless them in their efforts, that you would show us how to be able to unite together to strengthen the whole body. Lord, we continue to pray for our local schools. May you bless the students and the staff. May you continue to help the youth grow in knowledge. May you grant the provision to the staff to be able to accomplish their task. Through their days, may you draw them closer to yourself, helping both young and old to know that true knowledge only comes from hearing you. Lord, there are times where we feel helpless, not sure what to do, not sure the next step to take. When we find ourselves in those moments, Lord, we ask that you help us to pray without ceasing. But Lord, in the moments where you have shown us what to do, where you've given us the means to act, let us not forsake prayer, but let us pray while we are moving. Lord, if any in all of these prayers, we as your children can be the answer, show us how. Let us take the principles we've been learning through Nehemiah to become the answer to our own prayers. Encourage us to lay down our own lives as you did, that example that you set for us, so that we may show true love for those around us. 
Lord, let us seek out that which has captured our heart more than you, that which we are desiring or worshiping more than you. Continue to search our hearts and test our thoughts and to lead us in your ways. Father, you have blessed us with so much in this life. And today you have given us an opportunity to give some of that back, whether it's been through our time or through our finances. Lord, we pray that you would bless both the gift and the giver. And as we look to the future and we see that the needs we continue to have, we pray for your provision. Provide the people, provide the finances, provide every aspect, O oh Lord. Let us continue to seek you out. Lord, when you place us in situations that we don't understand, when you place people in our lives and we're not sure why, we ask for the grace and understanding to be able to minister to them. Lord, as a church, may we continue to seek to honor and glorify your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in.